Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the crazy world of Namnatom, the destined planet. I'm Marcus Aurelius, and this is the continuing adventures of Aurelius Steelballs, the amusement of urging. And as you can see, the graphics look substantially updated, as does the text. There is a story behind that, and that story also is the explanation for why we are here in the steps of Velvet, actually in the town of Playsplashed, when in the last episode we were way up here, in the lair of the Horned Freak. Well, what happened was the game became very unstable for me. It was crashing more and more often until finally we reached about here and every step I took in the travel mode was a crash. I was very disappointed by this and I upgraded not only the game itself but also the new player pack. Which for the record I think should not be referred to as the new player pack. It should just be referred to as the pack because I think even experienced players prefer it because of all the utilities and different enhancements it provides. However, that is also a problem because upgrading to the new version did not do anything to solve my crashing problem. And after some experimentation, what finally did solve it was disabling DF hack. Now in that case, it wasn't that big a deal because I don't think DF hack really has much of a connection to adventurer mode. Had it been Dwarf Fortress mode, I would be in some serious trouble. But I thought about it for a second, and that I thought about it because I was like, poor Toady. He may be hearing from people all the time talking about bugs that they are attributing to the game itself, when in reality, they are caused by DF Hack or other ancillary programs that come along with the new player pack. It must be such a headache for him to have to determine which bugs are actually part of the game itself and which bugs are part of the new player pack or DF hack. Regardless, turning off DF hack solved my problem and I made it down here. However, I decided that now is as good a time as any to retire our friend Aurelius. While I've mentioned many times that this game, in terms of world building and all of the civilizations and their interactions with one another and the historical creatures and their histories are incredibly deep and expansive, the actual gameplay really isn't. At its core, the adventure mode boils down to going around, finding out about either beasts or goblins or bandits or monsters going out and killing them, and then coming back and telling people that you killed them. The game unfortunately doesn't really go much deeper than that in terms of gameplay, and we've been doing that for many episodes. This series, Anvil Quested as a whole, including Fortress Mode, is probably either at or over 100 episodes at this point. It's been going on for over a year and four months of my life. Three months? And I think it's time. I think it's time to call it an end. But before I do that, I would like to introduce our final companion. And for some reason I'm, that I'm not sure why, it doesn't tell us his name, or actually specifically her name. You have to actually go into the data for that. But it is Izvor. Now, Izvor is someone who commented quite frequently on all of my Door Fortress episodes, so I wanted to honor him in this way by naming our Elf Swordsman companion after him, and I had planned, of course, to go on more adventures, but again, it would simply be a rehashing of all we've seen already, that is going out and killing things and then coming back. And all the interesting and funny sound effects in the world is not going to continually make that interesting. So what I'd like to do at this point is I would like to go ahead and save this game, and this is going to cause my computer to think a little bit, so hopefully the recording doesn't go all wonky. That's a technical term, by the way, wonky. And we are going to pull up Legends mode. And we're also going to utilize the Legends viewer, but we are going to trace the steps of Aurelius and discuss his mighty adventure. 
Namna Tom. I made multiple backups so I can do this kind of thing. All right, so we're looking at historical figures and we want to filter for Aurelius. There we go. Aurelius Cade Stoha Theni Gossum, male human. Aurelius Steelballs, the amusement of Virging, was a human born in 133. He was of unknown parentage. This is not true. As we all know, Aurelius was the son of Stalcon of the Sunken Hills, who was a very notable citizen of the um, coincidental union of Scars. Although counts vary, it is universally agreed that Aurelius was of divine parentage and possessed of unnatural gifts. While Aurelius was certainly possessed of unnatural gifts, and he wielded a magnificent adamantine sword and shield, he was not of divine parentage. However, he did have some of the best mentorship and training in the world from not only his father, who was an accomplished adventurer and hero, but also Marcus Aurelius, the dwarven blacksmith, the legendary and greatest dwarven blacksmith of the entire Ageless Manor. The two of them combined taught Aurelius many things, and so he was destined for a life of adventure. And he was joined initially in his quest in the early winter of 161 by three companions, Devil Reaper, Lined Lessons, King That Crawls, Exit Roads, and Arcade Knight, Joke Mirrored. And as a group, they wandered the wilds for quite some time. Later, he was joined by Krug Smash, Blushed, Jested, and Arcade Knight II, Searpool, as two of his initial companions were murdered by a vomit demon who had somehow escaped from Fort Ara in Anvil Quested. Later, Aurelius killed numerous kobolds in Lorablistalbus, which was the name of their camp. Later, he struck down Kamade Wall Churches, Rickgo Our Partners, and Moody Pattern Unions, who were humans, and he struck them down in their bandit camps in Den's Hovel and the Carnal Hill. Then he became tired of slaying humans and instead slew a saltwater crocodile named Path Towns in Gully Authors. Later, he attempted to infiltrate a labyrinth, and he struck down the Minotaur, sneaked matches, the soldier mages of searching, and the name of the labyrinth was the Lost Obscurity. After wandering the wilds for some time later, and going into the midwinter of 161, Aurelius struck down numerous goblins in battle in different goblin camps in the northern realms of Namnatom. In this place, this camp of Spotted Scorpion, Aurelius murdered numerous sleeping goblins, and some that were starting to become awake. Numerous, numerous foul goblins fell that day. And then, while touring the cities of the Coincidental Union of Scars in the Eastern Realms, Aurelius struck down the elf Apossi Prairie Tongues in Sprayerns, and Apossi was the chiefess of the bandits terrorizing that city. So this was a great deed that no doubt the citizens of that city were quite pleased with Aurelius for helping them in this manner. While traveling in the wilds, he was ambushed by giant dingoes, staff carried, and rift grieving, and he killed them as well after they had unfortunately taken out a couple of his companions. Those companions were then replaced in the midwinter of 161 by Seminole Spike Mornings and Arcade Knight III Attack Problems. <laughs> I got 99 problems, but attack is not one of them. The three of them, or the four of them, I should say, delved deep into the Deviant Crevice, all the way down to the first cavern lair, where they struck down numerous goblins, as well as a dwarf, Aban Craft Takes a dwarf whose tale was sadly tragic because he was kidnapped as a child, or she was kidnapped as a child, by the goblins, and 
Stockholm syndromed into joining up with them and living a life of depravity and evil. A life that was put to an end by Aurelius and his companions. Finally, in what is his most daring feat of glory, Aurelius mortally wounded the horned freak Kulur Abisberry, the Tomb of Shade, who then bled to death in his lair of crypt skulls. Finally, before the end of this tale, Aurelius picked up the elf Isvor Bannerden to assist in his future journeys, which will take place off camera. So there we have it. Aurelius was related to these historical figures. He was related to these entities. He was a member of the Coincidental Union of Scars. He was a member and hearth person of the Councils of Squashing. I'm not even aware of what that was, probably the initial place where he started. He was a member of the Kingdom of Fainting, somehow. And he was a rumored killer of the Corridors of Hate, the League of Trussing, the Society of Grips, and the Poison Gorges, and the Target of Cloistering. Those must be the enemy groups that he had struck down. He had 47 notable kills, the most notable, of course, being the Horned Freak and the Minotaur. He also had 22 other non-historical kills. I wish there was a way that you can just have it automatically show not only your character, which they do with this blue, which is nice, but you're also, also your character's companions. But I have some good news for you, because Legends Viewer itself seems to have been updated. It has a lot more data, so either the export has been improved, or Legends Viewer somehow has been improved. Because it tells you more about what happened. You get a lot more data here. Although, it does not translate Adamantine Short Sword. Instead, it translates 295157. So you know that that, in the future, is an Adamantine Short Sword. But, we can look at all of his kills. But first, let's look at his companions. So Devil Reaper had numerous historical figures, including three children. Interesting. Wayward Plots. He was a, was a site building. He wanted to become a legendary warrior, and he did. He will live on in the tales of Aurelius and his noble and brave companions. He was unfortunately killed by the giant Ingo staff carried in 161 at the age of 59. Or no, 56. He actually was a part of a battle before he even met Aurelius, the Ferocious War against the goblin civilization of the Torments of Proliferating. Unfortunately, that battle was a loss, and there was over 2,500 deaths. His wife was Expa Roasted Stones, whom Aurelius took him away from, it appears. But he wanted glory and death, and that is what he got. King the Crawls did not have any children, but he was married to Tun Channelgilt. King the Crawls unfortunately did not have any kills. He was also found in Wayward Plots. And he was struck down by Seduced Bad, the Terrible Pusses. <laughs> what a name. And this is the Vomit Beast, I believe, the Vomit Demon. And his goal was to maintain entity status. He was a male demon born in negative 30. And it appears that he did many horrible things. He, oh wow, he took out Ketas, Onul, and Dodok. I'm not even sure who they were. They must have been with the trading party. But then he also took out Bry 7x7x7 seven by seven by seven in Anvil Quested. And this was off camera. As far as I could tell, this did not happen in any way that I noticed it. Yeah. That's a shame. 
I don't even know how this demon managed to managed to get out. So then we have Arcade Knight, the first Arcade Knight. No family whatsoever, strangely. And Arcade Knight was struck down also by Seduced Bad, the terrible pusses. We were then joined by Krug Smash. Krug Smash was actually worshipping Istro, the wildness of goals. But he got along just fine with Aurelius and his deity, Oban Bronze Flyers, the goddess of rainbows and light. He has a reputation with the poisoned gorges. And Krug Smash was struck down by the night creature Kulur Abbasberry, the Tomb of Shade. Now, Kulur was the son. Yes, a son who was the son of a night creature and a female dwarf who was turned into a night creature. And it is a good thing that Aurelius and his team struck him down because look at all these kills that he had. Doesn't tell you. Well, he had 41 kills. The latest being Krug Smash. All the rest, dwarves, goblins, elves. He was non-discriminatory in his murdering. Though it looks like he never actually took out a human until Krug Smash. And he finally bled to death on Opal the 22nd. So then we have Arcade Knight the Second. Arcade Knight the Second also worshipped Istro, the Wildness of Goals, and also did not have a family. Arcade Knight was the murderer of two goblins, finally, someone besides Aurelius who managed to kill some things. However, he did bleed to death. He was slain by the giant dingo Rift Grieving. And Rift Grieving is only notable because he killed Arcade Knight the Second. Then we have. Seminole. Seminole also had no family. His goal was to start a family, actually. And he could still possibly do that. He worships Thram Bushel Goats. And he has no kills, and luckily for him, he is still alive. Finally, then we have Arcade Knight the Third Attack Problems, who actually does have a spouse, Kima Moth Granite. Kima is still alive. Kima is a male human. Oh, so Arcade Knight's a female. Yes, I mean, he doesn't have to be. He could theoretically be a female too, but... Or a he male too. I just assumed. So, Kima is still alive somewhere. She is... She was attacked by a Minotaur. And, uh, escaped. Was this the same battle? I guess, yeah. So that's pretty tough. So apparently they split up and went off adventuring on their own. It's quite interesting. So, I love how it just says Arcade. Arcade Knight the Third is also still living. And finally, Isvor. Isvor was an elf, a very old elf, born in 99. So that is 62 years old. No children, no wife. Ismore was a member of the Forest of Odors, and is, for all intents and purposes, still alive and ready to do great things in the world. So there we have it. Those are all of the related entities to Aurelius Steel Balls, The Amusement of Verging. His friends and his former enemies. So once again, I am Marcus Aurelius. I would like to thank you so much for joining me on this adventure, not only with Aurelius Steel Balls, but also with the grumpy and persnickety dwarves of Anvil Quested. I don't know this for a fact, but I think that this may indeed be the longest Dwarf Fortress series, both in number of episodes and just the length of time it's been going on on YouTube. If it isn't, it's definitely one of them. So I've had a great time 
It's a lot of fun. I um, have been thinking that maybe in the future, when a new version of Dwarf Fortress is released, I might want to do short little mini-series campaigns on like difficult scenarios. Maybe starting a fortress in a desert or by the ocean. Glaciers are kind of overrated. Everyone does glaciers. And just maybe have an episode once every week or so and only have a few episodes, but just show the most important stuff. That's an idea, and perhaps you'll let me know in the comments if you think that's a good idea, if you think that is an avenue that I should pursue. Other options are mods. However, for right now, I don't think the mods are working that well with this new version, primarily due to the lack of invasions, how invasions used to be kind of miraculously appearing on the side of your land, but now they actually have to come from somewhere and have to have a history. And so in some embarks, invasions are very rare. So fun defense type mods like Fortress Defense or even Masterwork, which uses the Fortress Defense races, you can get attacked by a whole bunch of tiger men, dark elves, goblins, orcs, dark necromancers, different types of creatures, ice giants, but that would only be fun if the attacks were constant, not if you only saw an attack once every three or four years. But that's an idea, and then maybe if some mod out there does some things to adventurer mode and makes it more interesting and a bit more developed, or if Toadie does that in a future release, we can come back and look at adventure mode again as well. So I already said this, but thanks once again for watching. I'm Marcus Aurelius. Have a good one.